Thank you and good evening. And I'd like to start by just thanking Agilent for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, Jordi Labs, uh, over the last decade, has been, has been getting very heavily involved in extractables and leachables analysis. And it's really changed the way that I think about many products that I interact with on a daily basis. For instance, as I was getting my tea this evening, I was thinking about the fact that I'm drinking out of something that has a polystyrene lid, a cellulose cup, a wax on the interior of the cup, and then a, uh, a tea bag that consists of three different materials. Each of those with their own leachables profile, which then I'm going to ingest. And uh, you know, I go through life and I think about um, all of the chemicals that we're interacting with on a daily basis. And that's one of the reasons I'm very passionate about this area and about developing better ways to characterize the extractables and leachables profiles in these devices. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit tonight about, uh, first of all, what are extractables and leachables? Who needs um, to do this type of work? Also, the study design that's used when you're doing an extractables and leachables characterization. Uh, how we get to confident identification. And lastly, how we get to confident quantification of extractables and leachables. So to begin with, leachables are components that come out of materials at trace levels under the expected use conditions. Whereas extractables are those components which come out under exaggerated conditions. So because of that, typically your leachables are a subset of your extractables, but not always. Typical examples of extractables and leachables would include things like antioxidants, surfactants, slip agents, plasticizers, acid scavengers, and many other components that are common in plastic systems. When we think about the types of materials in which we care about ENLs, uh, the three main groups would consist of biomedical devices, especially implantables, food packaging, and also pharmaceutical packaging, because each of those obviously come in very close contact with humans. In an ENL study, the main steps of the study are, are shown in this figure. And basically, the first thing that we want to do is consider carefully what are the materials of construction that were used in making the material that we're going to extract. The more data that we have going into that study, the better we can predict what kinds of extractables and leachables might be present. We then spend time considering uh, which analytical techniques we want to use. And that often is controlled by which type of extractables we think are going to be present, as well as sample selection is very important and your extraction conditions. After we have gathered that background information, uh, we then will take and decide on which samples and controls we're going to use. We'll then extract them. We'll then identify the things that came out and then do method development to identify quantitative strategies for those compounds. Uh, then we'll validate that and go on and do the quantitation. And finally, we'll do a toxicological evaluation to ask the question, OK, how dangerous are those chemicals that were found to um, leach? Obviously, in a study of this type, um, quality control is very important. Uh, but one of the things that makes it even more important is the fact that every container that we might use to do an extraction with has its own extractables and leachables profile. And so you have to be very careful what kind of controls you set up so that you don't get false positives in these types of studies. When we consider the sample selection process, um, typically the things that we, we care most about would be that the sample that we are going to utilize is exactly like that which will be used in the final use situation. So we want to make sure that we're using the same production lines. We want to make sure we're using the exact same material supplies. Um, because all of those can affect the extractables and leachables profile. We then, uh, once and we conduct those extractions, we then have to take those extracts and prepare them to go into our instruments. And oftentimes, uh, sample prep is really the unsung hero in an analytical, uh, an, in an analysis of this type. Oftentimes, people don't think about this very carefully. One of my passions has been to, to really try to move forward in considering how the choices we're making are affecting the results that we're observing for those extractable leachables profiles. In particular, uh, when people take that extract and begin to concentrate it, or maybe they uh, do a liquid extraction on it, or maybe they do a solid phase extraction on it, what did we lose? What did we not capture? And then, therefore, we did not include that in our toxicological evaluation. And so there's a lot of important decisions that have to be made before you ever inject these onto your instruments. And, uh, and that can have a very large effect on what you do and don't detect. After we have prepared those extracts, we're then going to run methodologies like these. 
Uh, typically, in our laboratory, we'll use QTOF LCMS and QTOF GCMS because they're um, the, the best tools for identifying those unknown materials. We'll then also do Headspace, NMR, FTR, ICPMS, and PYMS. So we use a wide variety of tools. The reason we do that is because uh, any one tool is going to have blind spots. In this particular figure, what I'm showing is that uh, if I was, for instance, not to run Headspace GCMS, I would be missing the most volatile components. If I didn't run QTOF GCMS, I'd be missing those uh, semi-volatile components. And then if I don't run QTOF LCMS, I'm going to miss those low volatility components that are very polar. So it's important to run a variety of techniques that cover the full range of polarities and volatilities. Also, it's very important to consider just how sensitive your instruments are. Um, I have been very much enjoying, as we've been adding more and more new instruments to our laboratory, the increased sensitivity that we can get on, for instance, the new QTOF LCMS systems uh, makes my life a lot easier. It means I have to concentrate the extract a lot less, which means I get a lot less ion suppression. Uh, this figure just shows uh, various detection limits for the, the different techniques, um, and you have to consider very carefully what concentration your factor you're going to use, depending on which technique you're going to apply. Once we acquire this data um, in, in terms of mass spec, we will then resort to using commercial databases for compound identification, but we also rely heavily on our own proprietary databases that we built up through tools like the PCDL, the Personal Compound Database and Library, uh, that we build up with our own uh, chemicals as we identify, and we keep enriching that library over time, making it better and better through each analysis that we perform. We also um, use molecular formula generation, as well as MS-MS analysis in order to further identify unknowns. This is one example of the kind of data that we will obtain. Uh, this is a MS-MS spectrum that we obtained on an unknown uh, from a plastic that we extracted. We then compared this with our internal libraries and got a good match for steramid so that we were able to identify that this is a slip agent coming off of the plastic. In this particular example here, we obtained no match in either our database or in a uh, commercial database. So we then took the MS-MS spectrum and began to manually deconvolute this after we had done MF, um, MFG. And we looked, by looking at the fragments, we were able to get back to a confident identification for this particular unknown. Once we have identified what is present in the extractables and leachables profile, the next important step is to quantify it. And this is another area that I have a lot of passion for because I feel like the way this is currently done in the industry is not very good, to be honest. Um, particularly, there's two strategies that are widely applied. One is formal quantitation, which generally gives very good quantitative values. And the second is relative quantitation, in which a surrogate standard is utilized. And uh, you then get a relative value. And depending upon which techniques you're, you're using, uh, that may or may not be appropriate. Um, so the typical techniques that are used for quantitation would include things like ICPMS and LCMS and HPLC and NMR. If we consider then um, what would relative quantitation, what is the quality of the results that we get when we do relative quantitation, what I'm showing in this particular figure is a series of analytes that we've analyzed and we have then compared them against a, a grouping of different relative standards. Uh, and as you can see, there's a very wide discrepancy in the accuracy of the quantitative value that you obtain depending on which standard you chose. And therefore, um, the quality of the data that's going into the toxicological evaluation is varying substantially. And this is the widest or the most widely used approach for quantitation um, in the industry for ENL analysis. In our laboratories, we try to rely very heavily on formal quantitation whenever possible for the reason that you can see here. Uh, obviously, when we're using the actual compound as the standard in the analysis, you get a much tighter control over the accuracy of that measurement. And then, uh, in this case, we're able to demonstrate that we can get within the FDA's required criteria of 80 to 120 percent recovery for these compounds. And that then lends itself to an act accurate toxicological evaluation. Um, I wanted to show you one example uh, of some of the interesting work we've been doing recently on 2D UHPLC. When we get an extractables profile, uh, particularly on a medical device or a complicated packaging system, there may be a large number of plastics involved. And because of that, we sometimes will obtain extracts that maybe have several hundred different constituents. And we're tasked with quantifying all of those. Um, and that can be an extremely difficult thing to do. 
uh, if you uh, can't get all of those peaks separated. So we've begun to rely heavily on 2D UHPLC for this. Uh, this is my instrumental setup. Uh, I have a uh, quaternary pump in the first dimension, which then goes into my first column, and then into a variable wavelength detector. We then have a valving system where we can hard cut individual fractions, or we can do a comprehensive cutting. And then we send that into our second column, which we then uh, pass into either a DAD detector, or into a fluorescence detector, or into our QTOF system uh, for further identification and quantification. So here's an example of an actual chromatogram we obtained from one of our extractables profiles. And we're trying to quantitate bisphenol A out of this profile. And as you can see, there's simply too many peaks to get this resolved in one dimension. And uh, so that's preventing us from quantitating the bisphenol A. So in this particular case, we applied two-dimensional chromatography and were able to simplify that chromatogram by hard cutting the BPA fraction into what you see here. Uh, but even with two dimensions, we still had some overlap uh, between the BPA and other uh, components that were present in the system. So we then added the specificity of the fluorescence detector to give us a signal that was characteristic just for the BPA so that we were able to get a, a peak for this component. Uh, I really don't know of any other way we would have solved this other than using 2D UHPLC. In addition to, uh, to doing the 2D UHPLC, we also have um, been using uh, the 7900 series ICPMS systems because one of the uh, most commonly used um, simulating solutions is saline. And saline um, can be a difficult matrix because of all the salt that's present, uh, but because the 7900 series can use uh, up to 25% solids, dissolved solids, uh, we can analyze these directly and still get to very low level uh, PPT level metals detection uh, for a variety of analytes, even with all that salt present. So in conclusion, um, I would just like to say that uh, in doing a uh, successful ENL study, it's very important that number one, that we pick appropriate extraction conditions and that those conditions mirror the actual use conditions for the device or the packaging. Number two, that we are very careful in terms of how we treat those extracts because that's many times overlooked in the industry and in doing so we may be losing the very things that we're trying to, to characterize. Number three, we need to get to definitive identifications which is really where the QTOF instruments have been so valuable in our laboratories. And lastly, we need to do accurate quantitation and I think this is an area that's too widely overlooked. Um, just getting to values is not enough. We need to get to accurate values so that when we put those into our toxicological models, we can be confident that we are um, going to have an actual safe device or packaging system. Uh, so thank you very much.